Good morning. All right. So for today's reading, we're going to be in Psalms 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever it does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's go to prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we just thank you so much for our opportunity to be here together as fellow believers, as the church, the family of God, to sit here and learn and worship together. We pray that you're with us in the service today in all aspects, that you reach us where we need to be reached, that we remember each and every day how just wonderfully blessed we are, that you care so much for us even though there's really no reason you should or, or would even want to most of the time. But yet, you stand with us and you lift us up, and we just praise you so much for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God is the strength of my heart. You know, he had better be because my strength isn't going to cut it. <laughs> Especially in this world that we live in. How to live godly in an ungodly world. Indeed, that is the question for us today. You see that God's word, God's word is the same today and applies as much today as it has ever had in the past. But look around, open your newspapers, read the news. The world has soundly rejected it. Many in today's world, believe it or not, many there are many today, uh, they, uh, they understand the authority of God's word in the world. Uh, the problem is they, um, they just don't agree with it. And so there have been a number of efforts over the years uh, to make changes. Uh, I'll give you a, a quick example. A number of years ago, a group called the Jehovah Witnesses, uh, they don't believe that Jesus is God. So they came out with what they call the New World Translations, and they change a few key words here and there to suit their narrative. In more recent history, the homosexual community disagrees with Scripture's condemnation of homosexuality. So they have produced what is called the um, Queen James Bible. Uh, Seriously, it's out there. You can buy it. Look it up online. Uh, and, And they change certain words. They go in and change certain words in order so that they can have a godly approval of their sinful lifestyle. One of the latest changes I read about, I just I just heard about it this week and I, I ran across, I had to look it up online on a couple of sources, uh, but in uh, communist China, they're producing a CCP, that is the uh, Communist Party of China, a party-approved scripture. And in fact, the China Christian Council, understand Christians have been persecuted in China for many, many years, but they're coming out a version of Christianity that is party-approved. And and they call it the... Uh, Senecification of Christianity. That just means uh, uh, a a Chinese twist to Christianity as we understand it. And and in fact, the council says it will change the face of Christianity around the world. They're rewriting the scriptures to suit them, and they're going to export it. 
uh, one example I had read, and I looked it up. Uh, for instance, uh, in John chapter 8, where, where the woman found in the very act of adultery was, uh, was thrown at Jesus' feet, and Jesus says, uh, he who is without sin throws the first stone. Well, in that account, Jesus throws the first stone. They rewrite it to suit them. Today, taking a godly stand is so much more than merely standing for what we perceive to be right. It is standing up for the time, uh, for the timeless and unchanging truths of God's Word. God's Word does not change. And to make a godly stand, we stand with the Word as it was written. And most reputable translations that we have today that you hold in your hands, it, the truth is there. We need to be careful with some of the more modern translations coming out that are trying to be gender neutral and a few other things. We've got to be very, very careful. We have to understand God's word as it was written and as it was translated by godly people. I, I see a new translation. So I, I, go, I, I go up here to the front where the foreword is and it talks about the translation philosophies and I look at the names of who were on the translation committees and, and the godly and conservative seminaries that they were from and so on and so forth. I try and get an understanding of who made the translation. We have to be very careful. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at examples of making a godly stand in an ungodly world from the Old Testament book of Daniel. And the stories in Daniel, though we need to understand that they were written uh, about 2,400, 2,500 years ago, they're relevant today as they were at the time that the events occurred. Today we're going to look at chapter 1 of Daniel. The basic story centers around in Daniel 1 about the deportation of Israel into exile into a foreign land called Babylon. According to scripture, there were actually three deportations. The first deportation was in 605 uh, BC. And this was the deportation that Daniel and his three friends that we'll read about uh, were involved in. There were two others. The next one was in 597 BC, and the last one was in 587 BC. And what we understand about the one in 587, and this is the one that we tend to focus on, in 587 was also the complete destruction of the temple. In Jerusalem. We're going to cover the whole chapter, but for right now, turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. I just want to read for you verses 3 through 8 so you can catch the crux of where we're going today. Daniel 1, verses 3 through 8. Then the king ordered Ashpazanaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom there whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligent, and every branch of wisdom endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, who had the ability for serving in the king's court. And, or, and he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years and at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Verse 6. Now among them were, and among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Michel and Azariah. The commander of the officials assigned new names to them. 
to Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Michelle, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Verse 8. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we look at the example that Daniel sets for us, Daniel and his friends, Lord, may we be like Daniel. May we stand up for, for what, for what is holy before you and be unwavering in a world that is diametrically opposed to you. Lord, open your word to us now. Lord, grant us understanding in our hearts and in our minds. And may Jesus be glorified in this place today. For we pray all of these things in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. A number of years ago, George Schultz, I don't know if you remember that name, but when he was Secretary of State under the Reagan administration, he, uh, and I brought one from my office today, he kept a large globe in his office kept a large globe in his office, and when newly appointed ambassadors uh, would come in and have an interview with him, and when ambassadors coming from overseas were coming back for the first time and and able to meet with him and have an interview, uh, when they were leaving his office, he gave them one simple test. He said, I want you to go over to the globe, and I want you to point out your country to me. And they would go over, they'd spin the globe, and they said, well, I'm ambassador to Germany. I'm ambassador to Chad. I'm ambassador to South Africa. I'm ambassador to here in India. Well, one of Schultz's old friends and former Senate Majority Leader, Mike Mansfield, when he was appointed ambassador to Japan... Even he was put to the test. However, Ambassador Mansfield, when he spun the globe, and he stopped it right here, and I don't know if you can see it, he says, this is my country, the United States of America. And Schultz was relating on a, on a television show, uh, C-SPAN Book Notes, he said... I told that story subsequently to all ambassadors going out. Never forget that you are over there in that country, but your country is the United States. And, and, and you are there to represent us. You are there to take care of our interests and never forget it that you are representing the best country in the world. We must never forget where our home country is, where our allegiance lie in heaven. Philippians 3.20, Paul writes, he says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Too often we forget that fact. Too often we act like we are citizens of this world and of its culture. Those of us who follow Jesus and we know him as Lord and Savior, we know that Jesus has called us out of this world. John 15 verse 19, Jesus says, If you were of this world, of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world. I chose you out of the world because of this. The world hates you. And the world hates us because we are not of this world. 
And we need to never forget that. that. This is the situation that Daniel and his three friends were in. They were, in fact, at the time, most scholars pretty much agree, they were perhaps as young as 14 or 15 when they were deported to Babylon. When they were taken away and they were placed into intense training in a pagan, ungodly world. But they never forgot to whom they belonged. Let me just take a moment here and sidestep a second. We're talking 14, 15 year olds. How did they happen to know God before they got there? Think about that. You know, it has a lot to do with families, you know, a lot to do with parents who instilled the word of God in them. I've heard people and they've said it to my face. Well, I'm going to wait for my child to get old enough and they can make their own decision. That doesn't work. Because kids are always going to choose uh, the shiny, the, uh, uh, the attractive, the most fun option. And it's not of the things of God. Uh, I tell folks, I grew up with drug therapy. My mother drug me to church Sunday morning. She drug me to church Sunday night. She drug me to church on Wednesday. And um, <clears throat> I don't think I turned out so bad. But understand, these kids had to have training somewhere before they ended up in Babylon, age 14 and 15. I'm looking at Darian. He's 17. You know, they're 14, 15 years old. And, 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 And you see... In the world, there's always been pressure for God's people to compromise their holiness. As this chapter unfolds and as we look at a few of the stories, we're not going to cover the whole book of Daniel, but we're going to cover certain key stories where they had to make a stand. And we'll see the importance of preparation to pursue holiness. The events of this important chapter plays throughout Daniel's life. Time does not permit us to examine all the details, but I want us to look at the big picture. Let's look at Daniel right from the beginning. Uh, Daniel 1 verses 1 and 2. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Verse 2. The Lord gave Jer- Jer- uh, Jehoiakim king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he, that is uh, Nebuchadnezzar, brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, little g God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Throughout the book of Daniel, one thing, one theme is prominent. The theme is the sovereignty of Almighty God. I understand Nebuchadnezzar went up against Jerusalem and besieged it. And Nebuchadnezzar thought that he had won a victory. But right there, look at the beginning of verse 2. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. He didn't win a victory. God gave it to him. And God gave him, along with some of the vessels, from the house of God. God gave it. All right, fast forward into Babylon. Verses 3 and 4. Then the king, that is Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youth in which there was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence, and every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, who had the ability for serving in the king's court. Uh, We're talking the cream of the crop here. Uh, They were getting the absolute best that Judah had to offer. And it says, he, that is, uh, Nebuchadnezzar ordered him, Ashpenaz, he ordered them to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. He ordered him to cherry pick from the very best, from the well-to-do families and the nobles, those that already had some education. 
And these bright kids, the, they were the athletes. They were the good-looking boys. They were the scholars. They were most likely a part of a group of boys chosen from many different nations that Babylon had conquered. And usually the time for putting them into intense training, as they've learned from other sources, were usually 14, 15 years old. And they put them in for three years of training. Verse 5. The king appointed for them, excuse me, yeah. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice foods and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years and at the end of which they were entered the king's personal service. They were to enter an intense three-year training program. They were to have the best of everything, the best food, the best training. Their training most likely included things like agriculture, architecture, astronomy, law, mathematics, language, as well as uh, perhaps some occultic practices like divination and astrology. The training for them was to be the very best and they were to serve as the king's advisors and administrators for the kingdom. Verse 6 and 7. Now among them were the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the commander of the officials, assigned new names to them. To Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shedrach. To Michelle, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Now, we're just looking at the, these boys from Judah. Uh, and, and we know where the story is going. But there are obviously more who did not exhibit the same level of uh, faithfulness that these four did. But you understand, when we look at the training that they were to undergo, it was more than academic. It was indoctrination into the Babylonian culture. They were to be assimilated, if you will, assimilated. And and several aims were in view here. Religious reprogramming, science, language, literature, diet, all carried religious as well as cultural meanings. First of all, let's look at their names. All of them, all four of these boys had godly Hebrew names. And and understand when we look at names in the Bible, those names that are ending in E-L, like Daniel, uh, E-L would stand for uh, uh, Elohim or God, if you will. Elohim in the the Hebrew. And names ending in I-A-H, like Hananiah, means Yah, as in Yahweh. So Daniel, if we look at it in the Hebrew, Daniel means God has judge. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. Michelle means who is what God is. Ask the question. And Azariah means Yahweh has helped. Their Babylonian names reflect the religion of that culture. Daniel was given the name Belteshazzar. We read that name several times as we go through the book of Daniel. And, 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 and that first part, that Bel, B-E-L, uh, or it's actually, we read in other parts of the Bible, it means the god Marduk, but it means Bel protects the king. Shedrach, means the command of Aku, Aku, which is the moon god. Meshach means who is what Aku is. Now, if we look at uh, uh, Meshach and Michelle, who is what God is, this is obviously perhaps a take on his original name. But who is what Aku is? And then Abednego means the servant of Nebo or Nego, which is the second highest god in their uh, litany of gods, if you will. You see, they attempted to obliterate any testimony to the God of Israel. Their indoctrination into that pagan culture included everything. The Babylonians were out to change their thinking 
to change their world view. Their view of man, their view of God, their view of what even right and wrong is about. They were out to change their worship and they were out to change the very way that they lived. We look at today and we have certain indoctrinations going on in our schools. We have indoctrination all around us throughout our social media. You know, we were talking about Facebook the other day. You never sit down on your phone and look at Facebook for 30 seconds. You start looking at your Facebook and then 30 minutes has passed before you realize what happened. You know, we're indoctrinated. There's all kinds of stuff. Well, there's some godly stuff on on Facebook. Well, that's true, but I've seen some very ungodly stuff. And 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 a lot of stuff that it, we wouldn't say it's ungodly, but they're 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 pushing you to one side, you know? There are different things. We, we got our social media. We got what's on television. Do we realize the ungodly influence that comes through our living rooms, you know? Uh, we got what's on the computer. We got going to the movies. Uh, uh, and they're all telling us how to live our lives. And they're instructing us in the new definitions of what's right and wrong. Then we come to verse 8. Verse 8. But Daniel. Boy, I love these parts in the Bible where they start with but. Now we're, we're, we're shifting gears here. But Daniel made up his mind. I like the King James. It, it, it says that uh, Daniel purpose in his heart. I mean, think about what that's saying. Uh, he made up his mind. He made a gut level decision. Okay. He said, uh, this is what's going to happen. He made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food. Now, why did he pick just the food versus all of these other things? Well, you got to draw a line someplace, okay? And and understand, these are 14, 15-year-old kids, and, and, and they're coming up against Nebuchadnezzar, which we got to understand was the most powerful person in the world in that t- that time. And, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar can say off with his head, and guess what happened? Their heads were off. You know, uh, those who, who said lives, live. Those who said he dies, dies. They were up against him. And, and they said he would make up this, uh, his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine that he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Daniel and his three friends, they were de- de- per- determined not to compromise. Uh, and when they look at the food, especially the meat, under Understand, coming from a, a Jewish background, there was a lot of food that weren't kosher. You know, they ate horse meat, they ate uh, pig, uh, and and that they couldn't go there. But most of all, most of the food, especially the food that came from the king's table, they were all dedicated to idols. Now, if you go over into 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11 and read through there, uh, that was not a new thing. Uh, the, uh, Paul was dealing with food that were de- uh, dedicated to idols in the, in the town of Corinth. And he was talking with them about that. But understand, the foods that were dedicated to, uh, uh, to pagan gods, including the wine, now, when we look at the wine, they probably drank wine straight. And in the Bible, that's called strong drink. And in and, and Jewish culture, generally, wine was diluted anywhere from 4 to 1 to 7 to 1. They, they, essentially, wine became a flavoring because the water is bad. But, but, uh, but here, it was probably more than the alcohol content. It was the fact that it was dedicated to idols. And so this was a courageous act that he was starting uh, to venture on. And at first glance, the request seemed simple enough, but the factors considered in this act of refusing the food, to refuse the royal diet would have been taken as an insult to the king and an act of direct disobedience to Nebuchadnezzar. Pressure from Daniel's peers... 
Think about that. They were among a group of folks being educated. And certainly peer pressure made it more difficult. I mean, everyone's doing it. I hear that from my kids. Everyone's doing it. My mom used to say, well, if everyone jumped off a bridge, would you go along with them and, or jump off a cliff? And Probably so, but that's, that's another story. But understand, everyone is doing it. And by choosing this course of action, Daniel and their friends were setting themselves apart from others. They were different. They were strange. Therefore, they might have been shunned, if you will. And number three, such unorthodox behavior could jeopardize their chances for advancement. Think about it. You know, you want to be move up with your peers and everything else, but you don't want those strange folks moving up, do you? And then there's the temptation about the quality of food. You got to understand the food that they were presented with was the absolute best in the land. And they were refusing some scrumptious diet here. And so there was the temptation that they had to deal with. And 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 their new location, there they are in Babylon, away from family, away from their homelands. You know, Judah was 900 miles away, straight line. Understand that they had to go almost 1,500 miles, almost 2,000 miles by the way they had to get there. But straight line distance, they were about 900 miles away. And, and they're away from family and friends who would never know whether they kept God's laws or not. But at least they were very acutely aware of one fact. No one else would know, but they knew God would know. God would know. And they also knew that one day, everyone, everyone, we've talked about this here, everyone, uh, whether you're condemned or whether you're Christian, everyone will give an account to Almighty God. Everyone will give an account. And then, and then another thing, that a trap that many people fall into, it's natural to argue since God had not protected them. I mean, after all, they got hauled off in the captivity. They were kidnapped from their families, if you will. And and they were in this horrible situation. And since God didn't protect them, they didn't have to be careful to obey his commandments. They could have become bitter towards God and said, God hasn't been done good to me. I won't do good for God. How many people fall into that trap? God has been, you know, I've been angry with God. Why should I follow him? All of these factors cause many people to compromise their faith, compromise their holiness before God. But Daniel and his friends, they, as I said, they made a gut-level decision to remain faithful to their God no matter what. Now, God's at work here too. They honored their commitment to him. In 1 Samuel 2, verse 30, we read where God says, it says, Now the Lord declares, Far it be, be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me will be lightly esteemed. And so we move over to Daniel 1, verse 9. We read, Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in sight of the commander of the officials. Having made the determination to be faithful, they weren't arrogant about it. I know there are people today, I've seen some folks today, they came out of bad backgrounds, but then they carry their big black Bible and they're ready to thump the world on their heads with their big black King James Bible. Bam, we're going to, you know, we're going to, you know, these boys were not arrogant. And they went up to the steward and they said, please, skip down a few verses, verses 12 and 13. And it says, please, please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and waters to drink. I think the King James, if you got this, says pulse. Uh, that just sounds unappetizing. I think if I had nothing but vegetables to eat, I'd probably starve to death, but... Uh, 
And he says, then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. You see, vegetables or pulse, we're talking about food that was grown from the ground, from seeds. That includes grain. So they probably had some bread. But none of these things would have been sacrificed first to a pagan idol. So they basically had a vegetarian diet. And the passage, as you read down through, I'm not going to cover it, but it says they looked way better than the other folks. They look better than the other youths. And then look down at verse 17. As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence and every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. We know about that. He didn't go to denovation. They didn't tear open a sheep and examine their livers, which was the custom of that day. Uh, he didn't, didn't go to the occulted practices. God gave him uh, the ability to interpret dreams. It came straight revelation from God. And you read about that, especially as you get into chapter 2 of Daniel. You know, one thing, and and it just occurred to me, people say, well, there's not modern-day Daniels. There's things like this doesn't happen to modern-day people. Uh, He's not here with us today, and I'm going to mention him by name. We had a young man in our congregation up to a couple years ago by name of uh, Jess. How many of you all remember Jess? Jess was in the Air Force. He was an air traffic controller. Uh, he was sick for the first year he was here, and he couldn't even do the training. Uh, all the people there in his shop, very ungodly radar shop there, and they made fun of him because he stayed true to his Christian commitments. You know, he wouldn't go hang out with certain girls. They wouldn't do the drugs or the drinking, if you will. And they made fun. He used to come and talk with me. Uh because I'm being ex Air Force and I understood the flying environment, I understood air traffic control, so he could talk with me and and he would say, I don't know what to do, and all I could do is encourage him to hang in there. When he left here two and a half years ago, they begged him to stay. He not only excelled, and I believe God because he chose to first honor God, God honored him. He became the number one guy. He was a supervisor of everything that happened in that radar uh, uh, thing. He was a, he, uh, there was all kinds of qualifications. There's a lot of things that went on. And, and he was their number one trainer, if you will, not trainee, trainer. Uh, he, I, there was all kinds of things. They begged him to stay. Uh, Which, by the way, just a quick update on Jesse. He is fully qualified in the Minneapolis uh, uh, approach radar facility up there, uh, doing very well. And he's getting married in May, this upcoming May. And he asked Ellen and I to come up and for me to marry him. Uh, Jess was very special here. Understand, Daniel's happen today to those who honor God First. And, and as we read here, as we read in verse 17, for these for the youth, God gave them the knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. They stood out from the rest of them. Look at verse 18, 18 to 20. It says, then at the end of the days, which the king has specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, understand, he was no dummy. He was well learned. He was well educated. He was a, a, a way smarter than average guy, if you will. And he knew what to ask. And he says, they presented him before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king talked with them. And out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. And as for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times. Ten times better 
Then all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his, his realm. In other words, they are coming out of training and they were better than the guys who had been doing it for years. In fact, if you look at that last verse of Daniel 21, it says, Daniel continued to the first year of Cyrus the king. He continued in service for 50, 60 years, a long time. Now, we'll read more about him later. But, but make no mistake here, Daniel and his three friends, I'm sure they studied hard, but God gave them the ability and they took that ability and they ran with it. And God honored their faithfulness. Holiness came first. Holiness came first. They stood their ground. They determined in their hearts. They made up their minds that they would not be defiled. 1 Timothy 4.8, Paul writes, he says, For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now, understand, these guys got it made. Uh, Not yet, not so fast. As we read, and you know some of the stories here. We know, and where we're going next week, chapter 3 of Daniel, you know what happens in chapter 3. Shedrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, they had some trials to come through. They still had to stand their ground. And and over in chapter 6, we read about Daniel being thrown to the lion's den. You know, we, we read about these things. We're going to talk about them. They still had to stand their ground. 2 Timothy 3.12 tells us, Indeed, indeed, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You may be honored today, but somebody's coming after you tomorrow. And we have to stand firm always. Standing firm is not a, is not just a a one-time thing. It is a continual day in and day out to stand firm. Are we ready to live a godly life regardless of what the world says and does to us? As I started off with, consider a moment the upbringing these boys must have had before they were taken from their families. Something of God had been trained into them before they were taken. And there was a love of God before all of this began. You know, hard times are coming. And the time to make decisions to stand fast and to stand firm is not when trouble hits us. It's before it comes. Because you see, when trouble comes, uh, we're in a fog. Understand, uh, things aren't so crystal clear when bad things are happening all around us. But we can rely on the fact that we previously purposed in our heart, that we previously determined that we were going to stand for the things of God and the things that make us holy, regardless of what the world says. And I don't have to think about it because I've already decided I want to read a quote that came from one of my commentaries. It says that in order to overcome the pressure to compromise our holiness, we need to have an adequate preparation to pursue holiness. We need to be bathed in the teaching of God's Word through parents and the church. Talked about folks this the other day. You know, uh, primary Christian training happens at home. We only reinforce it here in church. We need a life of abiding in the vine. Remember chapter 15 of John? I am the vine, you are the branches. We need a constant abiding in the vine, Jesus Christ. For apart from him, the word says we can do nothing and we'll find ourselves compromising. But when we dare to be a Daniel in a world full of compromise, we will discover the power of of personal holiness. 
being accepted into the king's service was just the beginning. But we got to remember what Jesus said. Jesus said over in Matthew 6, verse 21, he says, For where your treasure is, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, One of my commentators say, it's what you believe is how you act. What is the desires of our heart? Is our desires advancement? Is it money, fame, acceptance by the world? Or is it holiness? Is it honoring God Almighty? Can't have both. There was a movie, and I've mentioned this several times before, and I love the statement, but in the movie that came out a number of years ago, God is Not Dead To, it's about the school teacher put on trial. How many have seen that movie? I know there's a number of folks who have seen it. But the the main character, uh, the lead character made a defining statement when she said, I would rather stand with God and be judged by the world than to stand with the world and be judged by God. With whom do we make our stand? And where are we making that stand today? You know, the thing about Christianity, it's not your best life ever. There are those in the world that had accepted Christ and things went for the worse because they're being persecuted for the things of God. But oh, the rewards in heaven. Oh, the rewards, the things that we give up. The thing is, we got to be focused not on the here and now, but we got to remember where we're heading and the rewards that will come. And we will be tested here. No one said being a Christian would be easy. But the, isn't, this, isn't this great that we can gather together? I get strength from coming here and being with you all. There's coming a day, mark my words, I'm not a prophet, I just read the scriptures. There's coming a day when gathering like this will not be possible. We need to be gathering our strengths together today. We need to be making our determination in our hearts and making up our minds today because the world won't be a fun place tomorrow. And it's easy to say all of this here and now, but there's coming a time, mark my words, not my words, mark the words of Scripture. There's coming a time when it's not going to be so easy. And we need to make a stand today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we are here together as your people, Lord, as we are gathered together, Lord, may we be determined. May we be determined not to file ourselves and to remain holy before you, just as Daniel and his three friends have. Lord, may we be a Daniel in the world in which you have placed us. And may our hearts be pure before you. Lord, there may be someone here that realizes there is more to this life. And Lord, that it rests in you. And Lord, they have may, uh, whether they're here or they're listening online, Lord, We just pray that the sun not set without them coming to a saving knowledge about Jesus. For Jesus is not a way to you. Jesus is the only way. And may we come, and the rest of us come closer to Jesus. We need your strength. And we need your guidance. And we need your hand of protection. Lord, may we draw closer. May those who need to come know you for the first time, may you draw them today. Move among us. May Jesus be glorified. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.